welcome from my side uh, to this panel on shadow banking. My name is Steffen Kern. I'm the chief economist of the European Securities and Markets Authority in Paris, and I also have the pleasure and privilege to work closely with the ESRB on shadow banking issues together with uh, Richard Portis. We chair the shadow banking expert group of the ESRB, and it's great to see so many people from uh, the NCAs, the national competent authorities, the central banks that participate in our work on shadow banking so actively and contribute to that work, and without whom our analytical knowledge here, at least in the financial supervisory system, would be inconceivable. This panel on shadow banking is ideally placed between uh, the earlier discussions we had today on the banking situation um, and also then later on on the policy questions in the non-bank sector. And uh, it is also ideally placed because we just had one of the pioneers of shadow banking thought, Tobias Adrian, uh, with us talking to us. So this is a very timely panel for today's sessions. And uh, let's see how we can discuss these very pertinent uh, questions that we have. Just as a little scene setting on shadow banking, um, in his opening speech yesterday, uh, President Draghi already highlighted the role of shadow banking uh, and the interconnections it creates in the financial system, especially here in the European Union. So in terms of the importance of the topic, there is nothing to add at this stage. Uh, and this gives us an opportunity here on the panel to go directly uh, and focus immediately on the risks that we have in the shadow banking system and the implications that this had. Now, 10 years after the uh, onset of the financial crisis, we do look back at uh, substantial progress and advances in terms of both the knowledge that we have about shadow banking, but also about a wide range of policy measures that have been taken to contain the risks in the system. And those measures range from uh, in the EU, uh, EU capital, uh, capital requirements on the banks and financial reporting standards, especially when it comes to shadow banking uh, related activities, for example, special purpose vehicles or securitization as well. We have a full regulatory and supervisory framework now for credit rating agencies. We have a full regulatory framework for hedge funds under the AFMD directive. Um, the, so sh uh, sh uh, hedge funds have been brought into the regulatory perimeter, as it was called by the G20 at the time. The same applies for money market funds, uh, the, uh, a regulation that is currently in the process of implementation. In future, we will have a raft of data coming from securities uh, on securities financing transactions coming from the new regulation that has been passed in Brussels and that will bring light to a market that is very much in the shadows still today. Now with all of these measures and there are many more around this, the EU has in fact spearheaded the regulatory risk management if you want of shadow banking up to the point that if we read uh, the reports by the FSB, for example, um, we apparently are at a stage, and I'm quoting the FSB in its latest assessment of shadow banking activities, shadow banking activities uh, uh, are found uh, to have contributed to the financial crisis, that these have declined significantly and are generally no longer considered to pose financial stability risks and that no other new financial stability risks from shadow banking can currently be identified. So this is great news, of course, uh, for all of us, but it would be a big surprise if that was the end of the story, and there are many topics that we need to discuss. Um, the findings of the FSB are reflected in the data. If you look at the FSB Global Shadow Banking Report, uh, but also at the ESRB Annual uh, EU Shadow Banking Monitor, um, both institutions have achieved a great, uh, to add great precisions to their measurement of shadow banking, focusing on the core activities and the core entities involved in shadow banking. And if we look at the European Union as it is today, core shadow banking, if you want to call it that way, has contracted actually by more than 4% between 2012 and 2015 and another 0.6% last year. Uh, while other non-bank financial activities in fact grew over that pe period quite substantively. Uh, this, and it also uh, measures uh, favorably with the international experience where narrow shadow banking as measured by the FSB still continues to grow by around 3% per year in 2015 at least, uh, even though that too is slightly lower than the general non-bank growth, uh, the so-called OFIs. Uh, 
Now, um, these are important advances, as I said, uh, and there is, but there is broad agreement about additional vulnerabilities that we need to be aware of going forward, and I'm just mentioning a few of them. Uh, first of all, liqu liquidity risk and leverage in certain fund vehicles, especially those that are exposed to liquidity and maturity transformation. Another one uh, that many people are working on is interconnectedness, especially between the banking sector and the shadow banking world, but also other forms of interconnectedness. Then there is pro-cyclicality, liquidity and leverage uh, risk through derivatives and securities financing transactions and also through the collateral transformation chain. And then finally, there is a wide range of activities uh, that are still in the shadows uh, that are not covered by uh, transparency or other regulatory requirements. Um, and uh, in addition to that, we have now a whole wave of new innovative and emerging technologies and shadow banking style activities that reflect the evolving, if not mutating, nature of the shadow banking system and the risk of regulatory arbitrage. Now, finally, let me say that despite all the progress that we have made, uh, the analytical work on the shadow banking system is still in its infancy, if not in an, at an embryonic state. Uh, the G20 process, FSB, the European Union uh, in Brussels, they have given us new data to collect that we've started to collect over the past 10 years. And it is only now that we are in a situation, or slowly but surely in a, in a situation that we can actually exploit this data. So this is actually the starting point of shadow banking uh, and analytics. And if we look into the next five to 10 years, I think this will be an important era for analyzing and better understanding the shadow banking system better still than we do today. Now, with all of these questions, uh, it is uh, fantastic to have a highly distinguished panel uh, uh, around me uh, that will discuss the uh, issues that we have on the desk. First of all, I am pleased to welcome Juliane Bergenau. She's an assistant professor of finance at Stanford. Uh, her research uh, focus is on the interplay of the real economy with financial markets and financial institutions. And I understand you actually received an award, the Western Finance Association Award, for a paper in, in this context last year. So welcome, Juliane, for joining us on this panel. Second, we have uh, Stephen Ongena, who's joining us from uh, University of Zurich and the Swiss Finance Institute, where he's a professor. He's a research fellow in financial economics uh, of the Center for Economic Policy Re Research on top of that. Stephen, thank you for joining us. And uh, last but not least, uh, Stein Klassens, the head of financial stability policy at the Bank for International uh, Settlements, where he represents the BIS in important senior uh, decision-making groups, including at the FSB, the BCBS, and the G20. Within the BIS, you uh, lead the policy-based analysis of financial sector issues, and you oversee the work of the Committee on the Global Financial System and the Committee Secretariats. Thank you, Stain, for being with us. It's a great pleasure to have you, and uh, as in previous sessions, we have 15 minutes each for introductory presentations, afterwards 20 minutes for initial discussions here on the panel, and then Q&As with the audience. Uh, with that, Juliana, please. Uh, let me start by thanking Richard for inviting me and having me on this panel. Um, so this is, session is about identifying and assessing the risk in the shadow banking system. And then first, what you want to do is to um, define what shadow banks are. And I'd argue that this definition is not really yet sorted out and that matters for all sorts of things. So what I, in a very broad um, start, I define shadow banks as those that shadow the asset and liability side, and those can be different institutions that do each, of traditional banks. So that would be either like lending or some form of deposit creations, for example, in like in money market mutual funds. So to give you a flavor of like why I argue that the definition of shadow banks is not really set, let me give you a sense of like what are some of the causes of shadow banks. So some of the cause, what causes for why these functions are performed outside of traditional banks. So it can be, for example, technological change. There's a few things that have happened over the last uh, decades that have caused some of the core function of banking, for example, lending, uh, to be performed by non-banks. Um, and, and the reason is that some of these non-banks have cheaper ways of um, delivering those same banking Things so, and you know, one of the things that you like fintech companies that have been uh, alluded to in the earlier sessions today 
do those kind of perform those kind of functions. Another cause of shadow banking activity can arise through regulation that uh, favor the business opportunity, improve the business opportunity for non-banks, uh, so we can also call them shadow banks, that would provoke a substitution away from traditional banks. And then finally, there's um, that lots of regulators, of course, are worried about is like a substitution of uh, within traditional balance sheet, off balance sheet, within traditional banks, off balance sheets. This would be the traditional regulatory arbitrage substitution towards like uh, off balance sheet vehicles. So I'd argue that this is an issue. We need a functional definition of um, banks as well as shadow banks. And as technology is progressing over time, those definitions will also have to be adapted. And to give you a sense of like uh, how you can come, can, uh, why is this an issue? I mean, it's the first issue is for measurement. Well, I can take the US financial accounts, um, the flow of funds, and can add up all those um, institutions, sectors that are listed there that do something similar on their asset side as traditional banks that are not depository institutions. The depository institutions are depicted here as the light blue line. This is from 98 to 2014 in trillion. And you see that, as we all know, the shadow banking system has grown tremendously over this time. But at the same time, you can, in the shadow banking system here, shadow assets are the dark blue line or violet line or whatever you want to call it. And you'd see that you can already pick this line apart. Well, why? Because some of these forms of shadow banking, for example, fintech companies, may not be featured in those because their functions are not really, or their business model is not balance sheet based. So there will not, the balance sheet will not be reflected in that blue line. Some of them also is uh, activity by traditional banks. Uh, in their bank holding company can own security broker dealers, can own finance companies, can own asset back security issuers, and all in, in, in an umbrella that are part of this dark line. So what I, it matters for measurement, and it also matters for how to develop models and to thinking about shadow banks. So what are the firm characteristics that we uh, should uh, place into these models? What are the frictions? What are the environment that, these, uh, that we should focus on? And of course, all these gonna matter for um, policy results, as I will um, show you in a couple of minutes. And it also matters for um, not or no, thinking about the opportunities that can arise from shadow banking, from different forms of shadow banking that lie in an efficiency gain that can arise through like adoption of new policies, uh, new uh, technologies. So um, I want to add a few remarks on um, those models and I think about shadow banks and commercial banks. And I, as an example, I use a work with mine with Tim Landford, uh, where we um, basically think about what happens if you uh, impose capital requirement on traditional banks, what happens to the entire economy. And uh, in this model, it turns out that the presence of shadow banks is rather benign and I hopefully uh, come get to the intuition, and I'll talk a little bit about FinTech. So why we started this model? Well, because obviously the uh, financial system is composed of both regulated, commercial banks we call them, and unregulated financial institutions. So all of these institutions, and, so, and that's how we model them, provide some access to some uh, intermediated assets, so like in terms of long-term credit, for example, and they fund that with uh, some form of liquid money-like liabilities. When I, call, when I talk about liquidity, I typically think about this as in terms of money-like uh, liabilities of banks and non-banks potentially. So the, the question that we are asking in this paper is quite frankly, what are the effects of um, regulating a subset of the economy? So a big, a large concern is that also Tobias was today alluding to is like, well, then we're gonna ship off, we're gonna increase activity of the shadow banking system. And it's bad because we don't really know what these guys are doing, potentially. He didn't say that, but it is the implicit um, assumption on that. So, and that's, that's totally fair. And then, so the question is, does it increase the overall risk of the financial system? And therefore, we need basically a quantitative model to assess these um, trade-offs, and that's tricky. So the way how we structure that, um, we model um, basically commercial banks and shadow banks as uh, two separate entities. So it also tells you that here I had to allude to 
uh, or I'll have to take a stand on what type of definition I want to here uh, make of shadow banks. This is not an off-balance sheet activity of commercial banks, so these are two different entities. They provide, we model them to be tractable fairly similar. They provide um, liquidity services on their liability side. So let's think about deposits and deposit-like products that households value with a money and utility function specification. And they both can uh, go bankrupt if they take on too much debt, they can't repay it, and they go bankrupt. So um, that's bad for the economy, that's co there's costly bankruptcies. So the difference between them is that, well, commercial banks, their deposits are perfectly safe to depositors because of deposit insurance. They have to pay like some deposit insurance fee for that. And then um, they also face capital requirements on those deposit making activities. Then shadow banks, in contrast, do not face such re uh, restrictions. So the debt that they issue is uh, risky to households uh, because they may not be recovering all of it. We calibrate the model to the US economy and US financial sector. No, most notably, we make an effort to model uh, financial, like shadow banks, as fairly fragile, because in addition, because there's no deposit insurance, uh, which we know prevents bank runs, um, these shadow banks may be exposed to bank runs that then have also other ramification in the model. So the basic trade-off is then in this model, well, if you tighten the capital requirement, you uh, for sure you're gonna uh, reduce liquidity provision, which is like one of the key uh, elements in the paper, uh, elements, uh, uh, key functions of banks in this paper. Uh, but you do not increase the risk of the financial sector, even though shadow bank activity goes up. So this trade-off is basically between a reduction in financial fr fragility and a reduction in liquidity provision. So, and of course, obviously, we actually tried very hard to think about why, because that's not what we thought about, what we uh, came when we uh, wrote the model. Uh, and then you have to note, I mean, the premise here is that uh, the usefulness of, li of, of liquidity provision in the economy, that's the key thing that the banking's um, bank do in a useful way. So shadow banks compete with traditional banks in these functions. These two goods are fair. So the deposit of shadow banks and of commercial banks are fairly substitutable. However, up to a certain degree, so for particular in the crisis, uh, the shadow bank's liabilities lose their money-like functions. And we model this actually in a neat endogenous way. The shadow bank's debt pricing is, um, because its uh, debt is here risky, is sensitive to the default probability of shadow banks. So there is, uh, to some extent, these shadow banks internalize the risk that they're taking. We also, in the calibration, we impose some risk, uh, we introduce some random bailout of the shadow banking system such that the shadow banks do not fully internalize the costs that uh, they uh, take on if they use uh, more leverage. But in general, they take into account the risk that they are uh, alluding to. So when the capital requirement is increased in this economy, because uh, it increases the cost of capital for commercial banks, commercial banks um, reduce the balance sheet. That's the uh, first step, what happens here in this economy. Uh, in this would be basically happen in partial equilibrium if prices stay constant. This increases the scarcity of a good that households care about, deposits. And because these um, two deposit types of shadow banks and non-shadow banks um, are fairly substitutable, the value of all deposits increases in this economy, also that of the shadow banks. So the bond price increases, therefore, and the, that induces a reduction in the rates so these banks can, all of them can fund themselves as cheaper rates. So it sounds very unintuitive, but it happens in, in well, it's because it's in general equilibrium effect. And of course, on empirical data, this is not what, what we measure because empirical models or sorry, empirical studies that are um, well identified are partial equilibrium uh, effects and the margin. So what we are studying here, and that's why these models can be useful, is a general equilibrium effect. So when there's a reduction in the good that households care about, liquidity provision, there may be a change in the prices that can actually improve, again, the funding conditions for banks, everything else equal. This gives an incentive for shadow banks to fill the gap, right? They face better funding conditions because uh, they can basically s uh, substitute uh, for households what they want to do. They can do this either by levering up, increasing more liabilities, levering up, therefore. This would induce, of course, higher leverage, and the higher leverage induces more risk-taking and higher probability of default, and would lead eventually to lower bond prices. 
or they can just expand in the scale and uh, keep debt and assets in proportion, so keep leverage constant, so they wouldn't change their uh, risk that they're having, uh, and, but could still satisfy uh, the liquidity need in the economy. <clears throat> What we find, and that's really fa fairly robust accounts, speci uh, different specification, is that they, in our model, uh, as long as households care more about the quantity of liquidity provision compared to the composition, uh, the increase in profitability is large enough so that risk-taking incentives is going to be reduced. And if you think about this, I typically, uh, so bank bank's gonna choose the second part. So the, <laughs> so as long, <laughs> as long as households uh, care about the quantity of liquidity provision, the profit conditions are uh, highly favorable to banks. And you can think about it this way, that typically where does excessive risk-taking incentives arise is typically when banks have low net worth and there's a negative sho shock. If profit conditions are improved, then risk-taking incentives go down. And that's is essentially what's happening in this model, and that's the intuition for why we get there. So we, in the paper, we have several of these uh, um, uh, tables that I will not go through from time, but it's basically here showing that um, if the capital requirement, these are the thetas, are increased from 10 to 20%, there is an increase in the shadow banking share, but no corresponding increase in the total risk that there is, um, the economy faces, which are here measured as uh, basically in realized risk as the dead weight losses from both sectors, even though the share has gone up from shadow banking activity. So our takeaway is well that higher capital that will lead to more shadow banking activity do not necessarily need and have to lead to more fi financial fragility in response. This has been robust to various uh, ver um, specification conditional on our setting and our premise, how we modeled and how we defined shadow banks in the first place. We made an effort to um, model sh shadow banks as fragile. However, we didn't model many other things as uh, Tobias was alluding to. We didn't, we, we base our framework on a rational expectation. There's no extrapolative or any other behavioral assumptions here in this framework. We do not model shadow banks as off balance sheet vehicles for regulatory arbitrage. We do not model strategic interactions and you can make this list, list very, very long. Uh, we also didn't con <laughs> consider this would be also on the downside why we don't find like a negative effect, but we also didn't model any positive effects that can arise through an efficiency gain that can arise from shadow banks. And on that, I want to conclude basically that um, what is often not considered is uh, that financial intermediation is very costly, aside of cost of capital. So we were today we are um, listening to some uh, speakers saying, oh, well, the cost of capital of banks and all in is like 2% or whatever. But in, in addition to that, there's also non-financial costs. Uh, so like, it's just like uh, non-interest expenses that are, can be fairly large. And Philippon and others have measured that uh, to be around 2% of assets. So if you think about the size of the uh, U.S. Um, banking sector of like 15 trillion, just like, I mean, uh, back on the envelope, there's like 2% of that. That's a flow cost per year that's pre fairly, fairly large. So uh, to this point, so FinTech and other, and I mean, those similar technologies are also now adopted by um, non, uh, by, by the banks themselves. Those uh, give a rise, give opportunities to lower these um, cost that the financial sector actually is using up in order to provide these uh, financial services that are important for the economy. And there's a several um, examples where this is uh, more or less successful, and I'm sure that there is, uh, there's a lot of ramifications for risk considerations. However, we um, have to think about that financial intermediation uh, can also learn or can improve in efficiency, and those efficiency gains can be induced from more competition, also from the shadow banking system. And so to summarize my points, I want to say that we need a common definition of shadow banks to both measure and identify the risk and uh, understand what are they actually the activities they're doing, also properly frame the issues so that we can um, study uh, policy-relevant questions, and also to note that not all forms of shadow banking uh, activities are not necessarily using a wider definition are not all that bad. And with that, I would like to conclude and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Juliana. Uh, hugely interesting outcomes of this. Um, that give us a lot of food for thought, but let me immediately
hand it over to Stephen for his presentation. Stephen, thank you. So when um, Professor Portes invited me a couple of, oh, quite a while ago actually, um, to sit on this panel on shadow banking, I was a bit stressed because I hadn't, hadn't been working on shadow banking uh, that much or at all. But I took it as an admonition of saying you should be working on shadow banking. So what I'm going to present today at the end of my talk is, is um, some ongoing work on this account. But before doing that, I want to also uh, talk a little bit about ongoing work on um, spillovers of regulatory arbitrage in general because um, it's, it's uh, clear that one important aspect of the shadow banking activities may well be uh, this type of regulatory arbitrage. Um, Julian was already talking about that. Um, and so on that account, um, I'm going to talk also a little bit on, on ongoing work on this account, talking through uh, a few empirical exercises I've engaged in. So um, without much ado, it's all about spillovers, not the type of spillovers that are uh, being depicted here. Um, that comes later, I assume, I hope. But so I'm going to talk about spillovers across sectors, across countries, and then um, into the shadows. So across sectors, and here, uh, to some extent, what I'd um, like to talk about two minutes is, is work that actually um, indeed uh, corroborates what uh, Tobias was, Tobias was uh, alluding to earlier, that targeted microprudential policies may as well lead to uh, spillovers into uh, different areas of the, uh, of the lending uh, by banks. And so here this is um, the microprudential policy, if they're targeted, they're going to go to uh, specific agents, uh, specific uh, sectors, and the, the, the uh, real estate business, uh, residential mortgage lending is, is a, a particular one we're going to focus on. Of course, these uh, targeted microprudential policies may affect other parts of the economy and may be circumvented by creative uh, agents. And so, I have a piece with um, Raphael Auer um, in BIS working paper where we look at, indeed, the compositional effects of the introduction of the CCYB uh, in, in Switzerland. And so here, um, there's going to be additional um, capital charges on residential property mortgages, uh, but not so on commercial mortgages or other business loans. And we're going to look at the uh, credit register of uh, Switzerland uh, to see, indeed, to try to identify whether or not uh, there are indeed these effects in the sense that banks start uh, shifting uh, some of their um, lending towards uh, the commercial sector because the, the data comes from the credit register covering all commercial credit. And so um, uh, allowing us, given us micro uh, data, we can sort of try to identify um, within firm or at least within cluster how indeed uh, banks that are um, uh, have more heavily exposed to these additional charges that come as a consequence of this uh, CCYB are going to start shifting uh, their lending. And so what we find indeed is that those banks, first of all, they're going to shift more to commercial lending, so they expand their uh, commercial lending. We don't have access to uh, detailed data on the residential property mortgages, but we do observe indeed that they are in increasing their uh, commercial lending. They're going to uh, lend at a relatively higher interest rate, but maybe more importantly uh, in, in this context is also they're going to start lending uh, to small commercial real estate and uh, risky firms. And so to that extent, even though it's, it's, it's impossible uh, with the current data to actually um, investigate this further in terms of maybe relabeling that they may be doing in terms of uh, making some of these residential mortgages partly into uh, commercial ones, uh, or whether or not also some of the um, uh, the property developers that seem to be uh, obtaining more loans uh, from these banks start uh, fulfilling uh, an intermediary role, at least on, on the basis of the extant data, what seems to be uh, present there is that there is a, a shift in terms of from residential to commercial, also commercial real estate, and potentially um, uh, to the extent that we can adequately measure this uh, more risky lending. So clearly in terms of um, other types of spillovers of this uh, specific real estate uh, focused um, um, uh, charging, provisioning. Uh, in the paper uh, on, on Spain, we did show that indeed uh, this increase in provisionings to construction real estate firms led uh, to uh, also some uh, volume effect in terms of lending to non-construction real estate uh, related firms, so really a compositional effect. 
and in, in, in a paper by Jose Luis and, and, and Gabriel and, and, and their co-author Anguren, they, they also show that there's also a compositional effect as a consequence of capital, uh, new capital requirements. So all of this suggesting that there's this type of spillovers going on. Of course, also a paper by Ayer et al. showing um, that there are these um, spillovers uh, taking place. Now, this is uh, within, within the bank, if you want. Um, Clearly, there's also, for global banks, lots of opportunities for um, arbitrage, regulatory arbitrage. And again, on, on this account, um, identification there is more difficult because typically it's, it's, it's hard for the time being to get full-fledged access to microcredit that covers many countries at, at once, which would be truly needed to identify uh, or at least take steps towards identifying um, spillovers, if not regulatory arbitrage where, of course, the hurdle is, is even much harder because you need to show sort of uh, one for one whether or not uh, this type of activities take place. But at least it seems to suggest that for the, from, from some of the extant evidence, um, regulations where regulations are laxer, uh, banks are going to start lending more and, and, and more riskily. And so that extent, country-specific regulatory constraints may also lead to some uh, risk-taking. Now, on this account, it may be worthwhile to point out that banks are, um, uh, if you start looking at uh, micro data on, 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 uh, on, on one country and, and, and observe incoming uh, shocks to which uh, banks in these countries are subject to, they're uh, very, uh, very nimble, if you want, in, in adjusting uh, their lending. Now, let me then uh, sort of conclude by uh, talking a little bit about an ongoing uh, project uh, with Natalia von Westenhagen and, and Peter Bednarek, who's, they're both sitting here in the audience, on the um, um, lending to other financial intermediaries. Mm. So the idea is there to look at how, indeed, for a, a subset of banks that may be uh, specifically um, hit by uh, the um, capital uh, 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 charges that are uh, uh, present in the uh, uh, standard, uh, standardized approach, how they may, because this is very much ongoing work, so I have to be very care careful, how they may engage uh, certain OFIs who are then potentially engaged, if not the same firm, uh, a, a same set of firms that this bank otherwise would have engaged. The data is, is here from the German credit register, and so the the, the, the idea would be, in the end, also to show uh, that the, the, the construction that is then being uh, present there, one for one, uh, at the firm level, within firm, results in sort of a, if you want, substitution for the uh, bank lending that is taking place before uh, uh, by the small private bank, and then uh, afterwards, in the sense that as these banks are trying to uh, get away from this uh, um, binding constraint of these uh, ca capital uh, charges present in their standardized approach compared to the other banks that potentially uh, are alleviating some of these constraints, they are uh, then um, substituting this type of lending with uh, lending through office. Okay? As, very, as said, this is very much work in progress. So um, now, what is the data that we have currently uh, lined up? So we have the Barkis uh, financial database and then the merge with credit register. Now notice that in this credit register, there's also uh, present regulated and not regulated other financial institutions, both as borrowers and creditors. Okay, so to this extent, uh, what we're going to what we're going to uh, try to investigate here in the process of investigating is that indeed uh, these uh, small banks that are going to be subject to this uh, capital adequacy regulation are going to try to engage certain. Uh, both regulated and, and, and unregulated um, financial, other financial institutions. So there are highlighted there financial services institutions, but there's actually also five categories with, within those which are going to be subject uh, to, to different types of uh, reporting standards. Then there's the uh, not, not regulated there, also present in the database in terms of their uh, credit activity, financial holding companies, uh, financial companies, and financial asset management uh, companies. Okay. Now, as I already said, there's much more to be done, so let me just report a few snippets of what we've sort of so far been lining up uh, in terms of um, data and in terms of, if you want, univariate statistics. So all German banks are going to lend to this set of OFIs uh, I, I, I just introduced. Um, 
Now, big banks, Landless Bank Cooperative, cent, uh, central banks uh, lend to many offices, but the small private banks, the savings and cooperative banks, they're going to lend to very few offices. Actually, in many cases, only one. And we, th we think that is, that is interesting because this potentially could be part of sort of a configuration that is, is, is present there. Now, over time, this exposure has increased dramatically. So small private banks sharply increased their exposure to this office after 2008 can see there, which is now uh, amounting to 30% of their core capital, okay? So now here, um, it's also the case that the lending of this office, at least what we are currently having re being reported, increased uh, quite substantially. Now, there is an issue here ab about reporting, so we want to be very careful with this slide. Having said that, the fact that they're actually appearing given certain uh, requirements of reporting is interesting that they suddenly are, are there. So the UFIs are now at least more actively or, or, or even uh, it to, to a larger extent potentially with all the caveats involved uh, acting both as lender and borrowers. Now UFIs are distinctively less risky than the real sector firms that uh, are engaged but they are going to finance real sector firms, uh, more risky real sector firms than, than, than these German banks. So this is sort of present in all these small Small numbers there, but um, especially when the offices are going to be financed by German banks themselves. So all in all, this is, this is interesting for sure, uh, tells us that we need to dig more into this. Anyway, is there something worth investigating further? Potentially. So after 2008, there's a, a, a very sharp increase uh, in, in how these private banks engage these singular offices. These offices are going to lend to risky firms, uh, especially when obtaining uh, credit from bank. Again, this needs to be teased out further empirically, but this could be, one motive could be to save on regulatory capital. Um, and so we plan to investigate what happens after regulatory, to this regulatory change, try to identify it better also in time, uh, how the share of the corporate credit wallet, how this substitution took place potentially uh, between this uh, private bank and the if you want the favorite OFI that is being lent to by this bank. Of course, there may be others that are engaging the firm and that makes it even more interesting in terms of empirical exercise and identification. Okay, very tentative conclusion. So clearly there's a lot of data coming I hear, so there's more need for empirical studies, spillover effects using loan level data. I mean, more research is warranted also to keep empirical researchers like myself off the street. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. So we've got uh, from the academic community one impulse, which is, yes, there is an arbitrage problem between banks and non-banks, but it might not in all cases actually increase financial stability risks, if I'm not mistaken. Then uh, Stephen uh, proposed that, espe uh, in the, especially through the research that you're undertaking at the moment, it might actually be that a lot of this arbitrage happens, but concentrated in a a small number of entities, right? And uh, that may be uh, very risk prone. Very important findings. And now over to the, uh, to the dimension and perspective of the international regulatory and, uh, and analytical body, the Bank for International Settlements. Stein, thank you. Well, thank you very much, and thanks again, uh, Richard, because uh, you were also the one that invited me. Um, so this is um, my perspective, not necessarily always a, as a policymaker, because part of it of the uh, my involvement with shadow banking predates my involvement as a policymaker, so to speak. So I'm going to give a little bit of a different slant on how to define uh, shadow banking, um, and uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, what to do about shadow banking, possibly in terms of what we have done already to date, and talk a little bit what we maybe can do f uh, going forward uh, and then end up in terms of monitoring, which already, as Stefan said, is an area where we have to do more. Um, so both Juliana and Stephen have given me some good lead-ins as to what it is that we need to um, uh, think about harder. Uh, I, being not a theory person, uh, I can only do simple theory. So I have this slide as to what uh, the theory of financial intermediation was before we kind of got shadow banking onto the picture. 
And this was my old way of thinking of it. We have savers, we have investors, we have these banks. So there's a box around the banks because there's a balance sheet, there's something tangible in terms of a balance sheet at least. Uh, uh, and they intermediate based on soft information, delegated monitoring. There's a huge amount of literature. Uh, people here have contributed to that in various ways. Uh, and then we have this more amorphous market-based intermediation, but it's largely based on hard information, verifiable, direct financing. So that was my simplistic theory that uh, we could think of a uh, textbook kind of uh, way of thinking. And then we had this more amorphous new uh, animal being introduced, shadow banking. Uh, the term I'm taking literally a little bit more than maybe other people do. I'm really talking about shadowy form of banking sometimes. Uh, uh, nevertheless, it was based on hard information and the sense it was uh, verifiable, meant to be verifiable, so the securitization of, of whatever your CDOs in the US and, and what have you. Um, at the same time was being intermediated because it was not done through the capital markets. You wasn't like standing up into uh, the market saying, oh, oh, who wants to buy my CDO? No, there was some involvement of some balance sheets, some intermediary there involved. Uh, so this is partly, I think, what the theory that uh, both Juliana and what Stephen on the empirical side is trying to address. And we're still not all the way there, and that's why I think we have confusion in terms of how to address shadow banking. Um, and it, it's been hard. Um, so we started, uh, and this was the FSB uh, giving us a definition, uh, this is the first one, credit intermediation involving entities and activities outside the regular banking system. Um, that was a very broad definition. I think it's one of these committees, uh, all of you have participated probably in those, you come up with something that has to work for everybody and you end up with something that nobody understands anymore except for two people in the room. Uh, so that was one uh, problem maybe uh, that was underlying that definition. Uh, I wasn't there myself. Uh, second, uh, we can go a little bit more, okay, let's do it functional and, and Juliana is, is pushing very hard on that. <coughs> well, let's talk about activity base. What is it exactly that we mean? What kind of a service do we want to describe with shadow banking? Uh, and then we can say oh, it's a collection of specific services. Um, that's fine. Um, uh, Tobias uh, has given a, a speech last week uh, uh, in Helsinki. He's a frequent uh, European visitor. And he told us uh, banking and shadow banking and market-based finance, finance is kind of continuous, but there are some discrete things that you can maybe draw a line here and there between these various forms. So, uh, not to disregard anybody, but I think the drawbacks to all of these definitions, I think that people probably recognize that, but already talked about the first, it's hard to think of all credit that's intermediate outside the regular banking system as being necessarily shadow banking. I mean, finance companies, what's wrong with those? I mean, they're, they're intermediating credit, that's fine. Um, secondly, there's a lot of intermediation of shadowy activities inside the banking system, so the definition doesn't necessarily work perfectly well. Um, the functional one, theoretically appealing, but it's then hard to say shadow banking uh, uh, around the world uh, because we then talk about something completely different, wealth management product in China are very different than the CDO stuff that we saw in the US. And it's very different than what we see in, in, in India in terms of non-bank financing structures or what have you. So in order to bring it all together then, we're gonna have to say everything is eclectic shadow banking. That doesn't work necessarily either. And lastly, uh, uh, the definition in terms of kind of the continuum but then we're back to more or less the same as number two. It can shift over time across countries. Um, so not to, to disregard any of these definitions, I think they clarify, um, but I, I think maybe I wanna go a little bit more towards the systemic risk part of it, because in the end, why are we worried? Uh, and uh, as Tobias has given us in the speech, we should be worried about financial system from a systemic perspective. We can't be regulating each and everything, of course. Uh, and there, I think it's, it's where the shadow banking kind of hits us in the face, because there are some forms of shadow banking that can lead us to systemic risk, and those are the ones that we want to focus on. Um, now, how do we then define those that are uh, of systemic uh, concern? Um, the definition I'm giving here, and I've, I've been using this for a while, and uh, is all financial activities except traditional banking which require a private or public backstop to operate. Uh, uh, so something that is similar to, to banking in the sense that there's credit risk, there's maturity risk, there's liquidity risk uh, probably involved uh, here. However, it uses capital markets tools. Like I said, it's in the middle box somewhere. Um, uh, yet it also is not exactly capital markets because it does require a backstop. As I said, in the middle, there is somewhere a balance sheet, somewhere something involved that makes sure that the final investor, who is, of course, you, there's always a demand and supply to shadow banking, that the final investor is willing to hold that risk because the tail risk is being covered by some backstop somewhere. Um, 
And that needs to be there because otherwise you couldn't do your CDOs, you couldn't do your securitization, you couldn't do your wealth management products, you couldn't do your non-bank financing in India or wherever it is. Uh, and as shadow bank, has to show that it, that a backstop is there to minimize that risk, to make the investor willing to hold that exposure, uh, otherwise he wouldn't get involved in, into it. Um. Now what's the problem in a sense? Um, well, that, that shadow banking that looks for that backstop in many different ways. Uh, so it's not easy and always uh, uh, practical to identify it. Uh, and that's where, of course, why we call it shadow banking. Otherwise, if it's on the balance sheet of the bank, we knew it and we can deal with it. We have our regulations, we have our supervision. Presumably, although not always successful, we can deal with those kind of risks to some degree. Uh, the shadow banking is, is particularly problematic here because it has a very low margin for operating. Um, it's not necessarily that it's operating at very high margin. So uh, without its own balance sheet, without its own profit generation, it cannot really provide the backstop. It's not a credible way of doing that. Um, so what it does, and it, it does, however, at the same time want a large scale of operations to be economically feasible, it looks for that backstop somewhere else. Um, it can do that in the private side, so back to the banks. There's always a capital there that it can look for. Existing institutions can also be insurance companies, for that matter. Um, or it looks for the public backstop that can be explicit or that can be implicit. Um, many forms of guarantees were used in the bad times of shadow banking, but they still are there in many ways when we see these shadowy banking forms uh, operating. And I gave you some examples as well. But if you think more generally of safe asset provision, which is an important component, as Juliana mentioned, of, of shadow banking, that typically looks for something of a backstop that can be an exemption from the bankruptcy code in the derivatives forms. It can be in the form of a, some stay exemption there. Uh, it doesn't have to be explicit. It can be an implicit uh, form. So. What does it mean for policy? Well, for policy means that we can zoom in a little bit more concretely, I think, on sh when shadow banking becomes a systemic issue. Um, so we need this franchise value. The shadow bank activity will look for that. Um, uh, that also means it's not easy to regulate because it is a little bit where the market is not able to provide the discipline. Markets are not good at disciplining tail risk, obviously, and that's exactly where the backstop becomes relevant and that the market will not discipline the shadow bank for that because it's tail, it's outside of their typical uh, way of thinking. Um, at the same time, it is within regulatory reach because, the, after all, the backstop is typically either from a regulated institution or from the public sector. So we could do dramatic things like exempt stays or get rid of stays, for example, if we wanted to reduce certain types of shadow banking activity. Um, it also means that migration is maybe less of a concern because you can't get, you, things can move away all the way to hedge funds, but then I'm not worried about it and I wouldn't call it shadow banking anymore because there's no systemic risk necessarily because I don't have the backstop there in the first place and, and hedge funds were not a concern in the last crisis uh, in terms of systemic risk. Um, policy issues. What, do, what has been done? Uh, the list of first five points is basically the FSB agenda for the last few years. Um, I think point one, much progress, is kind of cutting the ties between the banks and the shadow banks in terms of regulation, step in risk and the like, minimizing the, the direct ties, the indirect ties between banks and shadow bank activities. We're not all the way there as the uh, monitor for the EU, for example, shows, lots of interconnections still exist, so there are potential concerns here. Money market funds, US, of course, major reforms, maybe not the first best, but nevertheless something that is reducing susceptibility to runs. Uh, transparency, securitization, maybe even more than we needed, but in a sense, securitization has been maybe a little bit less than we would like to have been, but nevertheless, we have done quite a bit. Dampening for cyclicality, very difficult. No clear approaches that I can think of that we have really solved the issue with. Yes, the indirect ties we can reduce by making security financing more costly. So in that sense, reducing for cyclicality. But the other approaches, I think we still have a hard time making operational. Um, and then the framework for monitoring, I think that's still an ongoing task. So I'm going to give you quickly some data as to where we are. Uh, so the data is still imperfect, uh, I will tell you that, but uh, importantly the governance of this sector is by nature still imperfect because we don't have a single entity like a bank supervisor looking at this risk at the overall level. The ESRB, etc., you've done, made, all made great progress, but we do have to acknowledge that this is an area uh, 
where there's multiple regulatory agencies, cross-border components to it, all of that makes it very hard to think of a single uh, approach to this. Um, the two things on my list here that are unusual, um, I'm not necessarily pushing them, but you could think of a demand-side approach driving the bad forms of shadow banking out in some sense by providing public safe assets uh, that has been proposed. Think of T-bills. If you have many T-bills, you're not necessarily going to get the securitization. Now, whether we want that is a question, but it is an approach. And I think this, this, the last point is a more part, and, and Tobias also alluded to it, financial cycle. How does it interplay with these risks? Uh, how do we get these leverage cycles to spill over into the non-bank parts? Uh, we, I think we know less about that. Um, so I'll finish uh, quickly on, on the monitoring. This is really just giving you a snapshot of what the FSB came out with in terms of the monitoring report this year, how they've been trying to go down from the very big picture of the total, and uh, the numbers are out on the web, so I'm not going to give you them one by one, but it's going down from a 320 trillion total financial assets down to a shadow banking of about 34 trillion, which is obviously still a very large number. And then on the right-hand side, trying to slice that by what they call economic functions, uh, different types of uh, shadow banking. Yeah? So they're making progress in terms of the, what I would call back to the functional approach. Uh, uh, the next slide, it gives it a little bit better as to what the kind of breakdowns they have used. Uh, uh, these are the five economic functions. Uh, the first one is the most important, is, is kind of in investment, uh, collective investment vehicles. Uh, so I, I think this progress being made on the data uh, and the way they're going about it is really trying, I would say, triangulating entities with activities and then trying to zoom in on risks. Uh, so the chart on the left gives you back these, these five economic functions of which the first one was the collective investment vehicles. And you see that that have been growing where the other components are been shrinking and that's where we consider to them to be the most, most risk involved. Uh, so in that sense, in a relative sense, the shadow banking has been less risky. Um, and then on the right hand side, this is a triangulation between the entity and activity approach as to where are the risks, uh, risky components slotted, so to speak. Uh, is it uh, in the back in the investment funds or is it in the finance companies or in the insurance companies, broker dealers? Uh, so I think we're making progress here, but I think it's still early days because this, this does not necessarily give you connectedness. Um, um, so this activity measure is not giving you the links back to the banks or even among all the entities in the, in the system. It doesn't give you a sense of what's pro-cyclical or pro-cyclicality here. Um, it doesn't, of course, allude to what Stefan was saying, what's in the shadows. It doesn't at all address what's in the shadows because it only covers what's, what's out there. Um, and it doesn't cover things like fintech that are only going to be the unknown unknowns that are come to the forefront at some point in time. But nevertheless, it is a, an attempt. And, and if you try to then see what the regulation has done to reduce the risks, um, the big item here is, like I said, the increase in collective investment vehicles, so the, the funds, so to speak. They have increased a lot as in absolute terms, but also as a share of total sh shadow banking. So, and as you can arguably say money market reforms and other issues have done that. Then if you go by the other forms, the specific issues, regulations that you can attribute, try to attribute the decline in the more risky components. Uh, but I think it's still early days because it's, it's not necessarily addressing all the risks that we know ex that exist in shadow banking. Um, so to conclude, I think we still need to define shadow banking better with a good uh, systemic perspective. Uh, it's partly about shadow banking. Uh, the, all the examples Stephen has given us, there's a lot of regulatory arbitrage. I think that is a component, but there's more than that. There's also genuine demand for, for shadow banking. Uh, we need to consider those systemic risks. Uh, there are policy issues. Uh, I gave you five and two additional ones. Uh, that's probably not a uh, complete set. Um, but I think we definitely need better data. Uh, we need to uh, do that from the bottom up, more micro-based. And then we need to analyze it, obviously, as to what is causing the growth in shadow banking. Um, regardless, I think we're always going to need this somewhat of a backstop as a smell test. Uh, I think as regulators, as overseeing of, of financial systems, we always have to be willing to step in and say, say at some point in time, we don't like this uh, and uh, we do this for systemic reasons. Uh, that's tricky because markets want certainty, but I think there's no way around at some points you have to say that. Uh, thank you. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Stain, for this uh, very systematic overview of the state of the discussion. And let me just follow up on, uh, on your presentation and the systemic risk-based look at the shadow banking system where you make the backstops a central element in sort of de detecting whether an entity would be falling in that group or no. And you're saying that most of these back backstops in reality would be implicit. Step-in risks, I think, is, uh, is, is one of the things that would probably um, count in this regard. But the problem with that w wouldn't it, uh, would be that uh, you would only realize that there is a r uh, that, that there is a backstop after the fact after sim after something has happened. So on an, on an ex ante basis, measuring or trying to identify implicit backstop guarantees would be very difficult to do. After all, wouldn't it? I think this is always a regulatory uh, game that we, we play, and uh, it's always the regulator being a little bit behind. So uh, yes, we need a, but the regulator needs to take a dynamic perspective as to where they think the market is going. So if you go back to the development of shadow banking uh, in, in the US particular context, uh, with SPVs that were getting uh, uh, liquidity and other support from banks, that started out as a very initial credit line provision of liquidity support that we know from banking of over centuries, right? So, and then suddenly started to grow into something more. That, that should have uh, raised alarm bells, uh, I, I think, ex ante, to say that this is only exposed something that we discovered, um, I think is a little um, uh, naive. Um, so uh, let me leave to that. Uh, so I think that that is where I, the smell test is going back to somewhat of the governance issues that I mentioned before. Um, we have going to have this struggle, and this was this true in the morning as well when we talked about macro prudential issues and the like. Uh, uh, from time to time, we have to go into the market and say, listen, we don't like necessarily what you're doing is because we, we don't trust that you have covered all the risk on a systemic level. And it's not just only entity-based, right? Uh, because it's the collective um, misinterpretation of the market of certain risks. Uh. Maybe also bringing that to Juliana and Stephen, the, uh, th this definitional question around shadow banking and the perimeter question, how relevant is that for your own work and for the analytical work? Uh, is that a core issue? And I think you, you made an argument for uh, also the activities-based sort of perspective uh, on the issue. Is that an, of immediate concern to your to immediate work? Or is that something where you would say the main most important thing is that we dedicate our attention to individual risks that we see or that we smell in one way or another? I mean, personally, operationally, of course, um, this is going to be depending on sort of if you want a prevailing um, view on on uh, where exactly these um, shadow banks are uh, activities are located. I, I think from a sort of pure empirical point of view, one can sort of be agnostic and just see uh, the type of activities that take place. And uh, so in that respect, uh, I think it doesn't um, necessarily preclude uh, further empirical evidence. Yeah, that's what I'd say. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you model things, you have to know what you model. So um, you have to make a case for a definition. And I think uh, what is a um, key problem, though, with, with any of this definition, I mean, the question is of whether shadow banks, I mean, ideally, we want to have something that is, like, uh, systemically important. And what would that mean in many models is sometimes, like, risks that are not well understood. And so you have to think about, like, what are the functions where um, there are there are risks that might not end up to be well understood. So that's tricky. Yeah. Um, and uh, with that, a second question related to the definitional uh, issue. How we oftentimes we perceive the definitional issue as one of uh, incoming new risks that we look at um, and therefore enhancing the, the perimeter of the def definition time and again. So th that temptation is there, and it's uh, it's important. Um, do we also have already an idea, and given the advances at the policy level, uh, how we deal with um, taking uh, certain entities or activities out of our definition once we have the feeling and feel comfortable that uh, th uh, the risks have been addressed? Think of money market funds in the European Union, now that they uh, are under a full regulatory framework. Does this mean that we, if we were rigorous about it, take this out of our definition of shadow banking? I, I think the term shadow banking was always an unfortunate term. So uh, there's some elements of it that maybe shouldn't have entered uh, in the first place. Uh, 
uh, uh, so but, but then we should also be willing to take it out I think yes if we have confidence that these um, regulations are fully sufficient uh, at the same time and again it goes back to, to the point risk will shift so it's an endogenous uh, animal that you're facing right so uh, to say that risk uh, is, is always going to be reduced in one element of the financial sector I'm low to to go for that uh, conclusion yeah. So that definitional issue will be necessarily a d dynamic thing that we'll need to catch up with uh, and correct. But it is important you pointed that out in order to focus and help us focus on the on the risk analytical uh, side and exactly follow up on uh, on what we're identifying. And maybe that uh, risk side is the most prevalent one uh, also on this panel. Um, let me go right at it. We've got a, uh, in, in the, especially amongst the international organizations, a, an activity-based sort of approach uh, where we look at uh, things like liquidity and leverage and the transformation of, of credit risks and also the interconnectedness. Are we getting that right? Are these the right uh, risk issues to look at or are we missing out on something at the moment, technically speaking? Or also from uh, f from a pr from the perspective of profound analysis, Julian. I would refer to the empirical uh, crowd here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I guess uh, it's it's early days. Let me, uh, right? I mean, in terms, I guess uh, having micro data on this account will uh, greatly help. Also, I think there. Um, also, actually, seeing that there is, there is so little, I think, of course, m a lot is coming. I, I, I know, I guess, will help us a great deal in identifying some of the risks that are being taken over time. So, I think, in that aspect, um, yeah. Uh. Do you, if you want a wish list of what would be nice to have, uh, that's not going to be easy. So, uh, interconnectedness already mentioned. We need much better data there. That has to b is being done at the national level to some degree. Uh, then including at the ESRB level, but globally for sure we don't have that data yet. Uh, so we need to do more um, drilling down individual institutions sometimes, but as, at least to the sectoral level. Um, I think on the cross-border side, we have very limited data yet, and, and we know that's very important in, in many respects. So we would um, like to see more there. Um, inconsistency of data is... is is getting better, but still uh, is not there. I mean, uh, Richard Portas uh, last week pointed out the discrepancy between the micro and the, the aggregate data. There's a huge gap there. If you look at individual data, uh, we, we can do better flows. The funds data is, is nice, but uh, that should match up to some degree with the micro data that we get from commercial sources, right? Uh, and that gap is, is in some circumstances, quil quite large. Uh, um, I think we can do better in terms of thinking in a structured way of how we monitor innovation. Uh, so the smell test um, is, is, I was using it very loosely, uh, but of course we would like to give the, the regulatory community a little bit more of a template as to how to go out and, and monitor this. Uh, there are lots of networks of people that talk about how innovation comes about and how we can monitor it, but the more we can give that support and academics can help us in re that respect uh, of how we, we, do we document that. Uh, uh, clearly, market intelligence has been become a bigger area of central banks and regulatory agencies, uh, uh, but it's not yet a science and it's still a little bit more of an art. So I think they're uh, going beyond case studies and uh, would be very, very useful. Um, and then, then yeah, the, uh, drilling down, where is, where is the risk? Where is the, the externality, right? So why, why are we concerned about this? Because sometimes systemic risk builds up to this, some of the mechanism uh, that I mentioned earlier, um, but we may be able to document it if we had very granular micro data. So um, is, is indeed the behavior of in one individual contingent on the behavior of the other individual through which I then see the complementarity that gives me the, uh, the concern that I uh, should have? Uh, that, that data isn't always there, but nevertheless, sometimes we have it. Uh, security, uh, financing data is more available. Trade repository data is more available. Um, it's been collected. It's a huge uh, data exercise, uh, and I think we've only started to, to really get into it to address some of these issues in terms of shadow banking and risks that are out there. I know these have been other ones are, are starting, on it, but with the academics, maybe you have to give them a little bit more access, I'm sure. Maybe not Julian, this is more the theory person, but I'm sure Stephen would, would happily help you out in terms of uh, some happily of Happily take data also. 
just like one so I think one one of the key things that we have to think about is like where does the risk capacity of the residual claimant of whatever entity there is and if that uh, entity is uh, or person or whatever um, collection this residual claimant also aware of the risk and is able to bear it so I think even leverage may not be a problem if that uh, like hedge funds are oftentimes very highly leveraged but if that's then if there's uh, just a billionaire that is wiped out, it's not uh, an, an issue, potentially. Question if it's that the billionaire then triggers another um, a chain reaction, so that's then the complementarities that can take place, yeah. Which would speak directly to, again, to that uh, systemic risk sort of identification uh, of shadow banking activity. Um, and, and I wanna come back to that, uh, to that specific point. Um, because it, it shows the interlinkages through the system. You're saying like, okay, if we're looking at just one asset management entity, maybe a vehicle in it by itself, um, the question is, who does it affect? Who are, which exposures uh, exist in particular, if it is uh, leveraged, for example, or synthetic or not? Um, the question is, how can we best actually monitor this horizontal interconnectedness in, uh, uh, in the system? We are all already struggling, I understand, with identifying individual entities or very limited activities and find out how exactly the risks function and what the channels are. But how do we deal with much more complex uh, layers of inter interconnectedness? Well, I think, I mean, that that's at the moment is a huge problem of data collection and as well as probably um, processing power. But um, certain fintech companies already, sp I mean, they do this on a very small, a smaller case. Like there's this company called Interactive Brokers. They uh, do real-time monitoring of your portfolio and they allow investors to borrow against that. And so they allow you to, um, yeah, basically uh, borrow against margin and they liquidate you immediately once this margin position of the value of your portfolio in real time measured is um, below what you basically uh, had borrowed. So that, I mean, in the long run, I mean, I'm guessing we're far away from that, but uh, it's not, infe like not implausible to think why this not, um, why banks, for example, or even other shadow banks may not even want to, to have that something like that themselves, right? So because that can prevent them from then uh, raising equity in times when it's particularly expensive, <laughs> as Tobias said today. So. Um, they are uh, so like monitoring your own risk and uh, helped by technology can also be done across um, entities, although there's uh, still like a little um, idealistic. Stay. Well, I agree completely with Julia. I mean, I think the big data development that I've seen, I mean, if to the extent that Facebook can tell us what we're doing on a daily basis, uh, we, we should be able to do that uh, and, and what kind of connections we have around the world. Uh, we should be able to do it in the financial market as well. We have a lot of data there. Uh, so it's, it's putting the machine to work, so to speak, but that requires, of course, legal and other requirements um, to be in place. Uh, um, so it's not an easy task, but nevertheless, it's, it's on the technology side, not an undoable task, I would say. Um, but th there's another component of it which we didn't talk as much about, of course. To some extent, we're going to break these horizontal links by having a central clearing and CCPs in place. Uh, so um, the goal is to, of course, reduce through that netting and otherwise um, the overall risk in the system. Uh, we're, we're not all the way there yet in terms of both, I think, analytical uh, approaches, how much gains can we expect from such an uh, approach, but also, of course, having it all the way done that there is much clearing that way. Uh, so some of it is going to do through the policy side as well, I think. Stephen. Yeah, if I may add to that, so uh, clearly microdata is no, no panacea per se because obviously one can use it uh, to a better extent to identify, but then of course the, the big challenge is also how to aggregate this back up in a way which is then consistent with the identified uh, elements in the empirical exercise. And the thing on that, on that front, clearly some structural modeling in combination with uh, and the identification scheme that one has will be, uh, will be good. And that is, I think, uh, sort of the frontier, if you want, for empirical work right now. To what extent is the heterogeneity of the uh, landscape of activities and also entities involved uh, in that respect still an obstacle to, to what we're doing, um, uh, despite the new technologies that may or may not in future be available to do that? Um, but apparently, um, you, you already pointed at that. First of all, uh, the 
uh, landscape we're looking at is much less homogenous than the banking system. We know a lot about the banking system. F uh, there has been now a tradition of more, or maybe several decades, probably more than 80 years of, of profound knowledge about what banks do and what they don't do. Uh, in, in shadow banking, we're at a starting point. Uh, many of these activities, data don't exist. We're only getting there. Th but it is part of the analytical challenge that th the field and the type of activities are just so different, right? How can we best tackle that from an analytical perspective? Because at the end of the day, the risks are in individual institutions and in the activities between them. What is the best way of getting there? Is there innovation also an answer and, and, and looking at new analytical tools? Or is, that, uh, is, is there a, a new thinking needed for that? I'm, analytical tools will surely be helpful. New, new thinking will surely, uh, but I think it's for the moment at least still the practical agenda is, is number one. Uh, so we need to make progress on issues like uh, LEI, the legal entity identifier. We have something called the unif um, UTI and UPI. Uh, those still have to be there. They have to be harmonized so that we can know what are the tr transactions, what are the products, what are the entities, and how we can combine it. So there's a, I would say, more of a practical challenge for the moment uh, to, to overcome. And then the heterogeneity, yes, it's there. At the same time, we probably know that if we have 100 banks around the world uh, that we can observe and monitor well, um, we, c we do a lot better than, uh, we do already do a lot better. So we don't have to go to cover each and everybody around the world. So. That's, uh, keep in mind that uh, as well. I'd say, I mean, they um, interact in certain markets and uh, that's a way of uh, connecting again. I mean, that's I think that's more a question of uh, legal challenges and of ha if you're able to monitor them rather than like um, technical challenges in the long run. And it doesn't matter then if you have more uh, in different institutions once, I mean, the data cranking machine is set up and once the legal challenges are out of the way, which is a big if, if, <laughs> so. That's reassuring. And maybe the last one before I open it up to, uh, to the audience, um, Stan, you mentioned explicitly the uh, heterogeneity also across borders, that uh, in the European shadow banking system, in as far as it is definable, looks different from that in the United States and those two again look very different from what you see in Asia, in particular in China, for example. Um, what, uh, what is it that characterizes in particular the, the European side? Is it, to what extent, for example, does the dominance of the banking system that has been subject of many discussions, uh, especially today already, to what extent does the, uh, the dominance of the banking system condition the way we Europeans look at the shadow banking system? Is it, you know, it's, is it a shadow banking system in its own right or is it in Europe actually more a banking system's shadow, so to say, that we're looking at? Is the European shadow banking system something very unique or very specific in that international comparison? It is shadow banking, so it's always going to be linked to the to the banks. At least that's how we we, we coined the term. Uh, I think, but in Europe, I think it's even more likely to be linked to the banks because the banks are such a bigger component of of the overall financial system. So yes, it is different than in the US where it's more capital markets that we're seeking out the banks. And here it's coming out of the banks, going into the non-banking, shadow banking. So uh, th so that back to the interconnectedness issue that was highlighted in, in the ESRB report, I think that's a very important component for the Europeans to track and be sure that there's no spillbacks <laughs> coming into the banking system. Uh, it seems to me that uh, in some sense a doable task where the data exists and approaches exist, uh, so in, in that sense, it's a little bit easier than maybe some other forms of shadow banking. And, and that would be corroborated, Juliana and Stephen, by your findings that the channels are maybe m mainly through f from the banking system into ancillary activities or arbitrage uh, activities mm -hmm. into which they are arbitraged out, right? That is where your, your elements would shine in. Yeah. Uh, and if I may, uh, for China, I mean, obviously, it's a very different system, but also there, I mean, I worked on China showing that maybe the formal informal uh, sector there actually cooperate in the sense of potentially uh, up to a certain point delivering uh, finance and performance for firms. So it's, of, of course, a much larger portion of the financing that these firms receive than in Europe. So, uh, and it's a very different uh, sector altogether. Which is a good point then to uh, open it up to the audience. Please give me a sign, uh, everybody who's got questions here.